All right, hello everyone. Thanks for joining us today uh, for this webinar on how to get the most out of Jenkins. Just gonna let everyone know a few things up top. One, we are recording. So for any reason, should you need to leave early or a colleague was unable to join, that's okay. You'll be able to see this again pretty soon. Uh, two, we are able to take questions. We're gonna have time at the end for questions. As soon as you think of one, even if maybe we might answer it during the course of the webinar, please go right ahead and ask it. It's always good to know people are looking to hear about even if we may get to it in the course of this. Uh, you can also meet myself and all three of our presenters at DevOps World Jenkins World in Lisbon this December. I'm gonna be putting a link to register as well as a discount code in the chat in just a minute for everyone to be able to use. Um, I don't wanna take up too much more time going into things. Oh, actually real quick, at the very, very end, a very short survey asking what you thought and what you'd like to learn more about will pop up. But beyond that, I wanna get started because we have a lot of content to go through. So I'd like to kick us over to our first presenter here, Parker. Thank you, Max, and welcome everybody. We're uh, really excited that you're here and I hope that you'll learn some, uh, some information today on how to get the most out of Jenkins. And so we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, very fortunate to have Ryan Smith on the line today and, my, and uh, Kasuke Kawaguchi, who you've probably heard of. Um, uh, the three of us will be presenting the content today, Ryan Smith and I doing most of it. Um, and uh, we'll get to KK here in just a second. But if you haven't heard of CloudBees, um, we are the number one contributor to the Jenkins project. Uh, we have the largest group of Jenkins certified engineers anywhere. And of course, we do offer uh, other CICD enterprise products and services. Um, and I will do a little brief why we're here, uh, go over the agenda and some housekeeping, and then we'll, we'll kick it off to KK, okay? All right, while we're here, next 45 minutes with you, we're gonna talk about some best practices with Jenkins, discuss JVM tuning and administration, uh, show you some real world data that we've gathered, um, and then also do an overview of CloudBees Jenkins support before we go and take some Q&A. Um, when, when you leave here today, we want you to be able to maximize your, your admin skills when using Jenkins. We want you to, to, to um, you know, increase your interest in uh, garbage collection, JV administration, learn how to do this better, and of course, um, have the best experience possible um, with the knowledge you take away here today. So with that, um, I'm gonna kick it over to a man that needs no introduction, uh, Mr. Kasuke Kawaguchi. Hey, thank you. So yes, I, um, you know, I'm the creator of the Jenkins and I've been in the Jenkins cloud visa forever. Um, and then ultimately, you know, I feel like I'm responsible for pretty much all the problems in Jenkins. So in some sense, I'm really great that the Ryan and Parker are doing this, um, uh, this webinar because uh, you know, they between what they're going to talk about, um, they'll help help people you know get the most out of Jenkins. So move on to the next slide. Um, you know, so I so I used to work at some microsystems, and uh, you know the Java virtual machine and also Jenkins to lesser extent is a sophisticated machines, right? They you know they run they are designed well and they are coded well so that you know they behave well out of the box. But just like you know, these like high-tech airplanes, they do have a lot of knobs and switches that allows experts to get the most out of it. Um, and then um, at one point, I'd seen like uh, some professional services contract in which they are charging an upwards amount of money to send out these experts to go out in the field and fix JVMs and other parameters. So you know, these things are real, um, and I have a lot of respect for this hard engineering work that goes on. Um, and then for the longest time, I also used to be the world first like, Jenkins administrator. And I took care of the Jenkins systems for my team for a long time. So that experience of running Jenkins for the team, you know, that made me realize that I had to add a lot of knobs and switches in there. And then uh, there's a lot of supportability features that I think of that are baked into Jenkins. And hopefully, you know, in this and in the future webinars, we'll cover some of those. Um, next slide. Uh, but with that said, you know, that there, yes, there are a lot of knobs and switches, but you know, there are some times when you just kind of want to forget about those and just be on the airplane and take you to the destination. Like you don't want to, you don't want to know all the gory things that the pilots have to deal with because you have more important things to do, right? In your context, that means you have application that you need to deliver. Um, then and then sometimes it's getting the most out of Jenkins, like you're making sure that the flight goes smooth, it gets in the way of you delivering the value to your customers. So in some sense, I feel like that's one of the fundamental value that the cloud is bringing to the table. Um, yes, as an administrator, you get to see some of the glimpses of this um, tuning and tweaking, but there are people at CloudBees, like Ryan Parker, 
that sees you know, 100x of what you see as an administrator because you know we, we help largest and like smallest of the instances around the world so you know in today's session you hear some of the glimpses of what these expertise and what those that much level of exposure to the higher hose gives them in terms of knowledge um so with that um moving to the next slides i'm going to kick it back to ryan and parker to take it from here Hey, thanks a lot, KK, and thank you, Parker. Um, thank you, everybody, for joining our presentation today. By the end of this presentation, I'm going to be able to show you some real-world data that by using the best practices we're going to talk about today, we increase Jenkins' performance at some of our Fortune 100 clients by 3,500%. <laughs> So the first concept that we're going to get into is Jenkins is a Java application. And I find myself saying this on a lot of phone calls with our clients. We see thousands of support cases here at CloudBees. And this is a concept that I, I really like to drive home because at the end of the day, um, when we have support issues with Jenkins, most of the time, they are actually on the underlying JVM side of things, and especially when it, when it comes to performance. Um, some basics about Jenkins is that it runs in a JVM. And as it runs in a JVM, it requires JVM administration. And part of JVM administration is defining an initial heap size, using JVM arguments, enabling garbage collection logging, and, and all those little system administration um, niches like log rotating and, and enabling system monitoring. But it's not something that you can just set it and forget it, for those of you that remember Ronpopiel. And it's, it's something that needs uh, constant attention and, and monitoring as your team size grows and as usage of the application organically grows. So this slide outlines kind of a high level JVM architecture, but the underlying class loader mechanisms and the garbage collection algorithms, this is commonly an area that's a black box for most Java developers. They don't really need to understand it. They just need to code, right? So what you really need to grasp here but without understanding all of, all of these inner working cogs is that the JVM really only has two primary functions. First, to allow the Java program to run on any device or operating system. That's Java's write once, run anywhere principle, right? Second, it's managing and optimizing program memory. So how is memory allocated in a JVM? Well, this is one of my favorite slides because it sheds some light on that black box from a memory allocation standpoint, and it illustrates some common misconceptions that we as JVM administrators have. The most common misconception is that the memory I allocate to the heap space is all the memory that the JVM will consume. That's not true. There's always memory in use from the JVM outside of the heap space. Now, some of you might be familiar with the concept of perm gen space from Java 7. And in Java 8, this is now referred to as Metaspace. And it's important to understand that Metaspace is unbounded. Now, there are JVM arguments that you can set to um, limit the amount of Metaspace that's taken. But for the most part, we, we prefer as a best practice to allow the JVM to make those decisions on its own. Because it, if you have a Metaspace leak, you'll, you'll know it real quick when you're, when you're a OS uh, performs an overkill. So and, and I just want to point out that you know these things have evolved a lot over the last you know the last years. So um, even if you might have been Java expert like me for the past like five years ago, this is the new world. Amazing. Yeah, absolutely. That's a great point, Kega. This is this is all pretty new architecture as of the last several years with with the the uh, Java eight and its maturity. So as part of all this. Garbage collection is kind of this voodoo science that, that lives within the JVM architecture, right? And there's a lot of different garbage collection algorithms out there that do things a little bit differently. But to break it down to a really simplistic overview, there's essentially three main steps to garbage collection to grasp. Firstly, objects get loaded into heap memory. And during a garbage collection cycle, the garbage collector iterates through all those objects and determines whether they're reachable or not. If they're not, they're marked for collection. So that's called the sweep phase. Once during the sweep phase, all those objects are essentially marked for removal and removed from memory. 
Then you've got the compaction cycle. And during that cycle, reference to objects are compacted down, which makes new allocation faster. So typically as JVM administrators, how do we monitor this, uh, the JVM world? Well, historically, we've looked at three things, which I call macro metrics. You're looking at application response time. How much CPU is my application using? And how much RAM? The problem with this is that the problems are difficult to forecast. So therefore, there's a concept of monitoring micro metrics, which is a good practice to employ in your environment. So what are micro metrics? Well, examples of micro metrics are object creation rate, garbage collection latency, garbage collection throughput, how many threads is the application using? and how many open file descriptors does it have? As a system administrator, you might ask, how do I collect and analyze all this data? Well, the good news is you can gather these micrometrics by analyzing garbage collection logs, thread dumps, and heap dumps. Garbage collection logging can be enabled by defining startup parameters for the JVM. Thread dumps and heap dumps can be collected on the fly by issuing commands to the JVM using tools like JCMD and JMAP which are provided as part of the Java Development Toolkit, or JDK. That's why we recommend using a JDK instead of a JRE as one of our fundamental best practices. Now, there's a lot of tools out there on the internet for analyzing garbage collection logs and thread dumps and heap dumps, but we at CloudViews use GC Easy for analyzation of garbage collection logs, FastThread for analyzation of thread dumps, and Heap Hero for analyzation of heap dumps. It's really cool because I mean, you used to look at these log files manually and to your point, like I, at one point or the other, I looked at every single one of those in order to keep Jenkins running well. So it's to the point. And again, like, you know, the service is well, that's amazing. So you know how painful it is then <laughs> without a good yeah, analyz know. analyzation tool. So um, I'd like to turn it back over to Parker, who's going to cover just a few challenges with Jenkins administration. Awesome. Thanks. I love this video. We'll uh, get it started here. It's a great depiction of um, some challenges with Jenkins administration. You see this rope swing going back and forth with quite a few people on it. And so imagine spinning up uh, your Jenkins instance at your organization, right? You onboard your team and, and things are going great. And then another department hears about how great your CI CD pipelines are running and want to jump on board. So it swings back and then it comes back one more time. And then another team goes, hey, you know what? I think I'll hop on too. And, and this adoption starts to grow exponentially and, and it's, it's difficult to predict. And so as we add more and more load onto this um, instance, uh, inevitably you're gonna come up against a, a, a breaking point and uh, you're gonna see that breaking point right there. And so it's a really, really good video to show, um, you know, a, a challenge when you're, when you're administering Jenkins. And, and so why is this so hard, right? Um, I think, JVM tuning skills is, is a great point to, to mention because it's, it's, it's a niche. It's not something you're going to learn in computer science, for instance. Um, usage. Uh, Jenkins usage grows organically. Uh, you know, AK, it's tough to estimate how many teams are going to jump on the Jenkins train like you saw in that video. And then, of course, loads. Loads come from multiple sources. Um, Long-running pipelines, REST API calls, uh, source code management polling, all these different pieces can cause performance issues. So, you know, it's important to note here that Jenkins itself isn't the problem. Instead, you know, you remember what Ryan has said, it's a Java application and these best practices with administration are very, very important. Uh, and so here you see, I'm not gonna run through these uh, point by point, but you'll, you'll have these slides to come back afterwards. Um, you know, is it, 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 there's a few things you can look at. Rotate your build history using a JDK instead of a, a JRE. Um, a solid state drive storage instead of your typical flash uh, flash um, storage, right? And, and then something like NFS where versions 3.0 and 4.1 are known to be better performing. So these little tips and tricks and best practices are, are, are really helpful um, for overcoming those challenges with the uh, uh, Jenkins administration. And while these, I mean, these things might feel daunting and this troubleshooting might feel like painful, but I just wanna like, you know, take a moment and sort of like a celebrate. If you get to this point, what that means is like what the, you know, what your the service you're providing to the rest of the organization has so much value that so many people are relying on it. So I think that's something that you should congratulate on yourself. You know, before rolling up your sleeves and dealing with these challenges. 
It's a great point. Yeah, so like Parker said, I mean, the, there's two. There's often multiple distractions to look out for when when uh, when looking for these issues because there's so many different uh, different areas where they could come from. So I'd like to get into how to diagnose issues like that and taking a scientific approach to that kind of data analysis. So initially, we, we get a lot of uh, support requests that you know, my CPU is high, my RAM utilization is high, kind of going back to that whole macro metric uh, methodology. And while we do look at CPU usage, it's often a distraction from the underlying issues of the JVM, right? So we look at areas like storage performance, we look at operating system D message logs, we look through the Jenkins service logs. There's even a slow request directory that that uh, logs how long requests take to the Jenkins server. These are all great areas to take a look at, but really when we're when we're diagnosing JVM related issues, we really really want to be focusing on micrometrics. And those micrometrics can be achieved by looking at the garbage collection logs, the thread dumps, and the heat dumps, and then subsequently doing an analysis on them, right? So all of those uh, tools that I mentioned are are free on the web. There are paid versions of them. Uh, which we we employ an enterprise version here at CloudBees. And as an example, you know, I'll run my garbage collection logs through the, the analyzer. And what I'm looking for is a really healthy pattern that looks something like this. We call it the sawtooth pattern. And what you'll see is that objects get loaded into memory and then that mark happens and that sweep happens and the, and the compaction happens and then you'll you'll notice that it, it creates this sawtooth up and down so this is indicative of a very healthy garbage collection cycle right an unhealthy cycle looks a little bit different and it looks something like this and you'll you'll notice that those red triangles on the right are full consecutive gc events that are taking place and what's happening is that there's too many objects that that are being loaded into um memory and the garbage collector the garbage collector can't keep up there's a, a great analogy from our friend ram lakmashan over at tier one app who is the designer of uh, uh gc easy and fast red and heat Pro, that he, he uses this analogy that you're basically trying to fit all these objects into a very small compact car and there's not enough room in the compact car we need a truck and so the the jvm has to work really hard in order to load all those objects into memory when it doesn't have enough room. Now, going back to micrometrics, there's early indicators in looking at these logs, and the early indication points are here. If we see those full garbage collection cycles happening, we know that we've undersized the JVM from a heap standpoint, or it's possible that we have a memory leak. So looking at those micrometrics early give you an idea before the issue actually happens where out of memory errors happen up here. I used to also look at the uh, bottom of the, uh, the, the cell pattern, like it's creeping up slowly and steadily. I wonder if that's still the case. Yeah, going back to that memory leak pattern, I mean, there, memory leaks are, uh, uh, memory leaks all look different from a graph standpoint, but they all have that, that demarcation of kind of an upward slope. So sometimes it's real fast, sometimes it's over time. And we've seen memory leaks that take weeks and we've seen memory leaks that take seconds. So it, it's the, that pattern is really something that we look for. Um, going back to thread dumps, thread dumps are kind of the same thing. We have uh, the ability to take thread dumps through using JDK tools. And once we've got them in hand, we run them through an analyzer and we get something back that looks similar to this. And in this particular case, you're looking at a somewhat high thread count, but most importantly, I'm looking at almost 100 threads that are blocked, and we wanna look and, and see what those threads are doing. So part of those blocked threads in this particular case, we see are all coming from the weather column. And so from a support standpoint, we know that it's not a good best practice to run the weather column in production. And so turning off or disabling the weather column resulted in, in a resolution for this particular case. Scaling horizontally is a concept that I want to talk about next. And the big question is, when do we scale out? There's a lot of variables in that equation. And the, the real answer to it is it depends. 
Jenkins is memory and I.O. bound. So monitoring those things can give you a good forecast for growth. And ideally, we want to flip the, the mentality that was used in the past of as JVM administrators would just feed their Java machines more resources, give it more heap space, give it more RAM, give it more CPU, and it would eventually become this monolith. Well, the problem with having those monolithic masters is that your blast radius is quite large. So we want to we want to avoid huge masters with hundreds of thousands of jobs on them. And we want to seg segment them out logically and kind of move forward to this forward thinking microservice architecture where you've got masters segmented either by team or business areas. But we do have a good rule of thumb. And the rule of thumb is don't give your master more than 16 gigabytes of heat. There's kind of two points to be set on that. Can you give it more than 16 gig gigabytes of heat? Absolutely. You're the JVM administrator. You can do whatever you want, but do you want to? Because the more heat that you give it, you're ultimately going to have longer running garbage collection cycles. And so we wanna see low latency and high throughput with our application. And because of that, we know that giving 16 gigs of heat has provided us 99% application throughput and less than a second of garbage collection in a healthy instance. So I wanna walk through these, these next few slides with you. This was a, from a presentation that Parker and I just gave at Jenkins World in San Francisco. And we're also gonna be giving it Jenkins World Lisbon. So hopefully we'll see some of you there. Um, some of the top five issues out of the thousands of cases that we analyzed were architectural pain points from finding a place for Jenkins to fit within your organization or your infrastructure as, is, as it already previously existed. There's also a lack of change management that we see or having change management playbooks, monolithic Jenkins or Jenkinsteins, consistent backups is key. And the number one issue that we see is that Jenkins is slow or unresponsive. Starting out with the architectural understanding is really identifying who your subject matter experts are to know who to go to for networking issues, storage issues, Linux administration problems. Who's your Kubernetes vendor if you, if you don't have one? Um, and ultimately, who's your Jenkins administrator? Jenkins doesn't have a traditional database. It's, there's no SQL involved. It all relies on the Jenkins home location that you define. So having a good understanding of how the application is built in your infrastructure is, is a good best practice. We hear from a lot of support cases when we ask the question, well, what changed in your environment? Most of the time, nothing, nothing changed. And that's really not the that's really not the common cause. Typically, there is something that changed. And it's because of miscommunication. There was changes to, to either pipeline jobs or network and firewall changes. Maybe your security administrator came in and updated the underlying OS. And ultimately, taking a scientific approach to these things will save you time and, and, uh, and money at the end of the day. Um, Having a good change management log is, is a great best practice. There's actually two plugins that we recommend right off the bat with Jenkins, and that's the job config history plugin and the audit trail plugin. And these plugins can help you find the answers to who broke the build and who changed what. Not having a good backup is another thing that we see as part of our top five issues. Either we don't have a backup period, or we've never tested our backups, or we don't, we've never tested a rollback strategy. So having a good playback uh, playbook for this and actually practicing a restoration is a really good best practice in the case that something has, something catastrophic has happened with your Jenkins instance. And you really wanna have a, a good low downtime, minimal blast radius scenario. So having a good rollback strategy is a really good best practice here. When talking about monolithic Jenkins, going back to that old school mentality of, feeding your JVM more resources. That is that is the old school way of thinking. And honestly, it, it produces kind of a wild west governance. It's really tough to keep track of so many teams using one Jenkins instance or one Jenkins master and who broke what and who introduced new code. And there's, there's just too many cooks in the kitchen. So the solution to this is really to just ditch the old school way of thinking We've actually got some great documentation out there on best practices around JVM administration. Following that 16 gigabyte max heap rule is a good demarcation point 
to know when it's time to horizontally scale and avoid building these monolithic masters. The number one issue that we come across is that Jenkins is slow or unresponsive. Maybe your developers are telling you they can't even get to the UI. Well, most of the time, the reason behind all this is either garbage collection over tuning. Maybe they're using some garbage collection setting or uh, archaic JVM argument that they found on a blog somewhere. There's the possibility for having rogue pipelines. There's the possibility for all these jobs are pulling the world and pulling down all these HTTP requests and ultimately causing server slowness. Um, tier three plugins can have an effect to this. There's also the slow file system that could be a, a in play. Ultimately, we've got best practices that address all of these common causalities. But the number one thing is to keep monitoring these things through using those micro metrics that we talked about. We've got some great resources in the slide deck that'll be sent out to you. And I would encourage you all to go through this and read it. Um, now we've got to the real world data that I want to show you. And this is some really cool stuff. So we engaged with one of our Fortune 100 clients um, a while back this year, and they came to us and said, hey, look, my developers are telling me that it's taking 10 minutes to log into Jenkins. So they go into their desk, log in with their keyboard, walk away, go get a cup of coffee. Maybe by the time they get back, they can log into Jenkins. Ultimately, what we found was this is a monolithic master scenario. And you can see right here through the KPIs by looking at garbage collection logs that the application throughput is down to 92%. What that means is that 8% of the time, the application is stuck doing garbage collection. And if you look at the number of garbage collection cycles here, that's almost 42,000 garbage collection cycles over the course of a 48 hour period. That's crazy. When you look at the latency, you're having 20 second wait times for the UI. That means that these are stop the world events. Nothing else is gonna happen until that garbage collection cycle finishes. So you get enough of these in a row and full consecutive garbage collection cycles behind themselves, absolutely you'll have 10 minute wait times. So in doing the analysis here, we ran this through GCT Easy, and we see that heap utilization is constant. But there's, there's JVM arguments that are in play here that we don't recommend. And ultimately, these JVM arguments were the causality of what we were seeing. So removing all these, these arguments led to resolution. But I want to talk about why we, we recommend to remove these things. If you go through and read the Oracle documentation on some of these JVM arguments, the overhead to the JVM is huge. And ultimately, what you're telling the JVM to do is work outside of its default algorithms. So there's kind of a keep it simple menta mentality that I want to introduce here, that if, if there's a JVM argument that sets values that go against the default algorithm of the, of the garbage collector, you're essentially throwing a wrench into the algorithm and having it work over time and against what it's intended to do. So removing all these led to resolution. And we see that throughput went from 92% to 99.468%. That's huge. We saw the max pause garbage collection time go down to three seconds. And we only had one of those events. And remember those 42,000 garbage collection cycles we had over a 72 hour period? Now we only had 2,800. So removing these and allowing the JVM to do what it was intended to do, which is manage the memory, we remove this performance blocker. And ultimately there's there's kind of a there's kind of a caveat here that I, I want to throw out to y'all. A lot of these recommendations that were made at a time, the, a lot of these recommendations were made at a time where the, the JDK was much younger. It wasn't as mature as it is today. So the JDK that was in use at this time was probably 1.80, 121, something to that effect. What we're using now is three years older than that. You know, it's 180212, I think is our minimum recommendation. But that's a hundred iterations of Java bug fixes, garbage collection um, improvements, and, and most importantly, improvements to the G1 garbage collector, which is what we recommend. So with all that, you, you see these uh, these big wins. 
yeah, kind of goes back to the point I mentioned earlier about things evolving. And I just wanted to add that, that when there's a, these large GC delays, like it creates a ripple effect, like uh, timeouts and like a lost connection to agents and stuff like that. And that's uh, that's really a proper gel thing for lots of users. Yeah, absolutely. It creates those bottlenecks that, that you're talking about. So some more real world data from a big shipping company that we worked with. Um, this is a great story where we've got a, an enterprise Java deployment with affecting hundreds of developers using multiple masters. And the problem that they were experiencing was that HA was failing over multiple times daily. And during those failover times, you know, they, they added it up. This is multiple hours lost a day for their development cycles. So if you look at the pause uh, garbage collection duration time here, you'll notice that some of those pause times are upwards of 25 seconds. And with that, the UI is not going to be available. These are stop the world events, right? So in looking at the data, we jump in here and we see that once again, there's some arguments that we recommended at one point because of a younger JDK version, but we don't recommend anymore. And most importantly, we noticed that some of the, the causes for garbage collection were these system.gc method calls. So system.gc method calls are really interesting. The Jenkins project doesn't use any of them, but a lot of third tier community plugins, developers will use a system.gc call to call the garbage collector and try to manage their memory on what when they feel it needs to be collected. This kind of goes against that methodology that I'm preaching that's like, let the JVM do what it's intended to do and don't try to be smarter than the JVM, right? Anytime that you're using a system.gc call, that, that inherently is what what you're trying to do is be smarter than the algorithm. So removing this all together and enabling disable explicit GC, we removed, this is just a small subset of, of what was going on over the big picture, but we basically saw a 3,500% performance increase. And the way that I'm measuring that is that our, our throughput is way over 99%. We're almost seeing three nines. But most importantly, our 25 second latency went down to 660 milliseconds. That's enormous. This this basically was uh, one of the biggest wins that we had from a, a support standpoint this year working with this company. So with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Parker. Parker, take it away. Thank you so much. Um, that's really, really great stuff, Ryan and KK. Um, always impressed <laughs> each time I uh, see this kind of information. And so for those of you that receive benefit from this kind of knowledge and expertise um, shared by Ryan and KK, I'm here to tell you with CloudBees Jenkins support, you can get access to the same level and caliber of expertise on a continuous basis. And so I'm going to give an overview of, uh, of CloudBees Jenkins support here. And, and Jenkins is critical. You'll see, you'll see here on this slide, um, if you're here today, chances are that you're hands-on with Jenkins uh, or your organization relies heavily on Jenkins to, to deliver value and, and get your applications out. And so, you know, a support and maintenance subscription with CloudBees Jenkins support is going to help you be as successful as possible and help you get the most out of Jenkins. We can go to the next slide. And uh, there's a need for deep expertise and support. And I think the proof is in a lot of the information that you've seen um, here today so far. It, it's a big Jenkins world out there and, and becoming an expert in all things Jenkins takes years of experience to culminate that knowledge. And, and unfortunately, our engineers already have that knowledge and, and have established that. And it's, it's something that's really special. So, you know, you can think about things like, where do you go to get your guess, best practices? Um, what happens when an issue pops up? Um, and how are you um, accounting for security? Uh, there are some complexities in Jenkins that um, require a lot of, a lot of care and, and understanding of the internals. And, and so uh, we've got that here. We can go to the next slide. And that's why we made CloudBees Jenkins support, right? We are the experts and you can count on us when, you're, when your business relies on pipelines uh, running and, and, and performing as expected. We've got the largest group of Jenkins certified engineers and, and our support is much more than, than break fix or transactional support. So it's not just oh, the world's ending, I've got a severity one issue, I've got to send in a ticket, right? It's, it's the kind of information, it's the, it's the kind of best practices that you've seen so far today that really make the difference. And I'm going to get into these pieces that you see on the screen here um, in the next few slides in a little more depth. First really, really big piece of value is that on-demand support and expertise. Um, I drive this point home a lot, I drive this point home a lot because it's really important, right? Only at CloudBees can you get this kind of expertise. 
Uh, and then of course, um, that life insurance policy is great to have, right? In the event that something does go wrong and you need some help, um, you can have that 24 seven with people like Ryan Smith here today. And then uh, another really, really big piece of value is our customer success team. Um, they're a passionate, really knowledgeable group of individuals that care about the success uh, of you and, and what you're doing with Jenkins. And, and they get there from onboarding through adoption and make sure that uh, you get the best possible experience. Mm. Next piece is training and knowledge, right? It, it may sound basic, but um, having the ability to grow knowledge in your own time is, is important and, and online trainings are included with your subscription and that goes beyond just a beginner level, maybe intermediate or expert courses. Maybe you wanna learn about pipeline best practices or Jenkins administration best practices. We've got courses for that. Um, and of course, documentation and knowledge base, extensive documentation, well-written um, and a knowledge base that people like Ryan and his team are adding to each time that we solve problems for a customer. So we wanna have that out there and available for self-service uh, in case there's a, a problem that you encounter that we've already solved. And then assisted updates program, I love this. Um, you know, uh, seamless upgrades, uh, usually when I'm doing this, I like to say, hey, raise your hand when, if you've upgraded Jenkins in the last six months. And then I like to say, you know, raise your hand if you wish you would have upgraded Jenkins in the last six months. And, and this is something that's really, really valuable. We have a program where you can plan upgrades proactively with CloudB support. Um, create an upgrade plan and then execute uh, upon that plan with Cloud B support at your side. So um, maybe you have a two hour window on a Friday and you've got to upgrade Jenkins. And of course that, that might turn into a, a weekend experience and we want to make sure that that doesn't happen. And, and assisted update program is a really, really good way to do so. Um, and then a, a, an added piece of value here is uh, the way that uh, Platinum gets live assistance. So um, you can get a consultation, build the plan and then get live help. So the next piece here, everyone loves free, right? We love free stuff. So, so I talked about Cloud Beach Jenkins support, which is one of our paid offerings, but we do have some, some value that I would encourage you to check out today. Um, the first one is Jenkins Health Advisor by Cloud Beach. Um, this is a completely free service in the form of a Jenkins plugin um, that is gonna help you improve performance and, and, and um, get the most out of Jenkins. And I would encourage you to, to check it out and download it today. Um, it is proactive, actionable insights. It'll automatically analyze your um, your Jenkins environment. Once you connect the plugin, which takes only a minute or two, um, it's gonna look out for potential issues and it's gonna send you detailed email reports every time a, a, an issue is identified. So you can get in front of it before it intensifies uh, and keep Jenkins running healthy. This is really good stuff um, and I encourage you to check it out and download it. You can, you can get it on your open source instance and then uh, it comes installed by default on what you're seeing here now, which is called CloudBees Distribution. This is also a free offering that we have. It's our rock solid version of Jenkins that we fully tested. It's dependable and it's gonna give you uh, increased stability, um, security, and then of course seamless upgrades out of the box with some proprietary add-ons that we have in the distribution. Um, some benefits there, some, uh, knowing which plugins are compatible and secure, which in a, in a land of 1600 plus can be difficult. Um, automatically managing plugins and upgrades. So something like uh, Beekeeper Upgrade Assistant and CloudBees Assurance Program are the two big proprietary um, plugins from CloudBees that we have that come baked into the distribution and help you manage those upgrades and plugins automatically. And then Advisors, as you saw on the previous slide, comes installed by default in the distribution. So you can um, get those detailed email reports and, and get in front of issues before they intensify. And so, um, you know, when you leave here today, if you have a minute or two, I encourage you to, to check out Jenkins Health Advisor. It's on our website, cloudbees.com. And then of course, Cloudbees Jenkins Distribution as well. Advisor is a product that I was personally involved in. It's early days, so I'm super excited about that one. Yeah, for sure. Um, really, really good stuff. And, uh, you know, the, the question I have to pose for everyone on the call is, are you ready to get the most out of Jenkins? And, and we are ready and willing and happy to help. And, and we'd love for you to, to let us know if you're interested. And there's a link here in the slides to the survey, the same survey that Max is going to, to send out. And I'd encourage you to, to fill that out because we would love to, to have a conversation with you. And with that, I'd like to give a, a big thank you to everyone here, um, especially KK and Ryan. Um, you guys are just just really impressive people. Um, and so I will hand it back over to, to, to Max here to close it out. All right, thanks, Parker. I took a second there because I'm seeing a bunch of questions coming in. And I kind of caught me off guard a little bit. 
so just to let everyone know a few things before we get started, I did put the link to that form in the chat. So if you want to sign up here for your free 15-minute consultation, please follow that link. Um, also, we've gotten a few questions about, oh, it looks like permissions needed to access the link. We'll, we'll fix that and make sure it gets out to everybody. Uh, also, a few people have been asking about the recording and the slides. Um, I, we only brought that up at the very beginning. So for those of us who joined late, yes, we did record. We are still recording. And we will be sharing this as well as the slides out after the fact uh, with all of you. So you'll be seeing that very soon. Now, we have a fair amount of questions. We've been getting them the entire session. So some of these may have been touched on already, but I do want to ask them again just to make sure that you know these are things people want to know. I want to make sure we really uh, nail it, bring it home. And also, some of them are a little similar. So I might combine a couple here and there. But uh, let's start with this one. So what are your recommendations for running Jenkins on virtual machines and running with uh, OpenJDK versus Oracle JDK? Yeah, that's a fantastic question. Um, virtual machines and, con and containers um, both have their own individual caveats, right? And what I think is important to remember is that the contract between the JVM happens at the operating system level. So there, there was some issues, specifically container issues, that um, we've had in the past with, with Docker and translating C group memory to, um, to the JVM. Those have since been resolved in some of the newer versions of the JDK, I think specifically like 180, 181, I think it was uh, backported from Java 11, where they now have container support. Um, when it comes to virtual machines, uh, again, I, I feel like the, the contractual obligation is between the JVM and the OS. So regardless of how you get the JVM spun up, or I should say, regardless of how you get the operating system spun up, that, con that contract exists between the JVM and the OS. Hopefully that answers your question. Yes, as we move along, uh, please, if you feel like it wasn't answered or maybe we've misinterpreted, go ahead and let us know. We'll make sure we get back to it. All right, we got plenty more here, so let's keep moving. Uh, in general, would you discourage use of a Docker-based Jenkins instance for any substantial or mission-critical use? Would I discourage Docker? No, I don't think uh, I don't think I would discourage Docker. I think Docker is where we as an industry have decided to take things. Um, and I, again, I, I think that the contractual obligation is between the, the JVM and the operating system. So however you decide to get it there from an orchestration standpoint or containerized standpoint, I think it's fine. Yeah, I think it's, uh, I mean, I think it's great because uh, in the Jenkins project, they published the, uh, the official Docker image. So these things, I think it makes it much easier. And then to Ryan's earlier point, I think the only thing we need to be careful about is like an older JVM you know, out of memory killing the whole process, but uh, that's a thing of the past now. Yeah, for what it's worth, I mean, Docker and, and technologies like, you know, orchestration tools like Kubernetes, they bring this whole new ephemerality to the whole thing. And, and that's where I think we as an industry are moving. And, and uh, so, no, I, I, don't, I don't look down on it at all. All right. Uh, let's see. Let's go on to this next one here. How do we export the JVM logs to those sites? Uh, where are they located? Okay. Yeah. Let me let me uh, let me process that for a minute. The JVM logs. I'm guessing what what they're referring to are the garbage collection logs. So specifically, you would set JVM arguments at at startup. Um, and some of those best practices are in links within the slides. Um, there's an article that's in our support knowledge base. It's called Prepare Jenkins for Support. That's a really easy Google. Um, that has all of our, our magic JVM arguments that, that we put together through testing. So part of those arguments are setting garbage collection logging locations. And it, you, you can define as the JVM administrator where those logs are written to. So wherever that, wherever you decide that is, you can then take that log and upload it to that garbage collection analyzer. With thread dumps, you actually have to 
issue a command to take a, a thread dump, whether it's through JCMD or, or uh, another JDK tool, there's multiple ways to take thread dumps. There, I would actually in, encourage you to Google um, how to take a thread dump cloud bees, and I've got an article written in there that, that uh, shows you exactly how to do it. Same thing with heap dumps. Um, you would use, again, JDK tooling to take a heap dump. Um, one thing that I will mention as a caveat is that heap dumps do have a lot of overhead to the running JVM. So be wary about taking heap dumps unless you actually need them. It's not something I would recommend taking on a proactive basis. It's really only something I would recommend taking if you're suffering from, from an issue, right? Um, but same thing, Google how to take a heap dump cloud bees and there'll, there'll be an article uh, written for you right there that I'll show it to. There are, yeah. there are magic supportability URLs inside Jenkins where you can request thread dump and heap dump if you're administrators. One of those things that might be a little easier than uh, using the command line tool, etc. And we put that link to the prepare Jenkins for support uh, article in, in the chat if you're curious. Yeah, and, and I, I think I heard KK say that the support bundle that uh, is part of the CJD distribution has um, a thread dump option that, that can take thread dumps, as well as pipeline thread dumps, which are also really helpful as well. All right. Uh, just to let everyone know, uh, we should now have that form updated so that you do not need the permissions to view it. If it's still giving you trouble, let me know again in the questions. But I will repost that link in just a second for everybody, just in case. All right, moving on. Let's do this one. Is the Health Advisor plugin, or uh, excuse me, let me reread that. Does the Health Advisor plugin transfer data back to CloudBees for analysis? Uh, yes, there, there is a level of um, phoning home. However, you have the option. There are some advanced options, so you can configure that to your liking, right? So you can choose exactly what you'd like to send or not send. So in these cases um, where you may not want to send particular uh, information, you have the ability to control that. All right, let's see. Uh, can you say something about performance with uh, Jenkins Masters on top of Kubernetes? Jenkins with uh, performance with Jenkins with Masters on top of Kubernetes? Um, I can say that. Uh, <laughs> one thing that, that I might add is like I, there's a lot depend on the storage driver, the volume driver, I guess that's the correct term. So I think that's something I saw some people uh, stumble upon and trip over. I think there's a, um, I think there's kind of an underlying question there, like what, what do we recommend as best practices for Jenkins Masters with Kubernetes? And um, what I will say is that out of the box, the um, the distributions have some what I would call initial setup right like they have some initial JVM arguments um, I, I got asked this question at Jenkins world and and I I hesitated for a minute but the um, the response I've come up with is as the JVM administrator you should be understanding what the needs of your application are from a resource standpoint so regardless of what the platform is um, if it's Kubernetes orchestration, if it's a Docker container um, that's that's running your JVM, ultimately, again, it's the JVM that needs to be administrated, right? So monitoring, still in play here. Those macro metrics, micro metrics that we talked about, that's still very valid. Um, you wanna be looking at garbage collection logs from your Jenkins master, regardless if it's running in Kubernetes or not. You wanna be, analyzing that stuff and, and preparing yourself for growth. And I think there's a beautiful ephemerality that comes with Kubernetes there, where it kind of almost for, forces you to adopt that microservice architecture, that horizontal scaling architecture, and makes it a lot easier to do this stuff rather than, you know, Jenkins on a traditional platform or, or bare metal. Hopefully that answers your question. All right. Uh, how about this one here? Can you provide recommended JVM arguments to improve performance? Uh, do you have any specific go-tos? Absolutely. There's a link that 
Parker just put into the chat for the prepare Jenkins for support link. This is one of our top links and that is where I've got all my, my best practices around JV arguments. I will say that, you know, any JVM argument that you add to your JVM should be thoroughly tested. And um, there, there was a time, I just kind of briefly mentioned it, like in the days of yore where we were feeding resources to the JVM, just giving it more memory and giving it more memory. And, and it really depends on what application the JVM is running. So in a Jenkins specific, um, being Jenkins specific, Jenkins requires a very low latency and it's a application that you're going to want to use the ui on and you're going to have multiple people using it and so therefore you want it to be available and because of that we found that the arguments that i recommend there are great for jenkins they may not work on all of your jvms but um, i will say that at some of our fortune 100 companies that we worked with they've actually taken those arguments to other java applications and had huge performance gains as well all right. Here's one that I'm not sure why I didn't ask earlier. Uh, we use open source Jenkins. Do you cover support for this or should they have enterprise? Great question. Um, we do. Uh, if you're on a Jenkins LTS within the last 12 months, uh, you would be eligible for support. So, um, of course, the same thing applies to, to the Cloud Beast Jenkins distribution. But, hey, if you're on open source, um, we, we can help. All right. Uh, does Gold provide the live assistance, and is Gold ticket-based or web app chat? So Gold uh, will still give you the consultation. You'll still uh, get help with the support team, but it won't be live assistance during the upgrade itself. And, and I'm, I'm, I'm assuming we're talking about the assisted update program here. Um, and what was this, what was the other part of the question? Uh, is Gold ticket-based or web app chat? Uh, so it is web and ticket, um, but it is a, it is used to ticketing system. So it's not a phone, you know, it's not a, a phone line, if you will. But yes, we do. Uh, we use a help desk. All right. All right. Let's see. Uh, here's a good specific one. So if I need to my JVM to run with four gigabytes, do you recommend settling both XMs, XMS and XMX to four gigabytes or XMS to 512K? Yeah, that's a great question. I bet I know who asked that. Wink, wink. Um, that uh, XMX and XMS value are the minimum heap size to start your JVM and the maximum heap size to start your JV or to it's minimum heap setting and maximum heap setting, right? So there's there's a concept that um, was promoted by um, our friend Ram over at, over at Tier One that setting both of those equally. There's an, there's an overhead to the JVM in um, allocating that memory, right? So you're gonna have to pay for that overhead either at startup or at runtime. And I think the concept of setting both of them to the same value does it, I'd rather have the overhead at startup rather than runtime. All right, let's, uh, let's talk about that bank problem you, you mentioned before. Did you use a Jenkins plugin to figure that out? bank problem um, let's see in that particular case we use garbage collection logging thread dumps um, the the Jenkins support uh, plugin the support core plugin provided us thread dumps and garbage collection logs in a nice bundled support bundle which is which is a tool that we use from a, a support organization side so yes we did um, can you get those without a plugin? Absolutely. Um, you can you can get them by issuing commands to the JVM. You can get them by um, retrieving your garbage collection logs. The real answer to your question is we got the analysis done through analyzing those micrometrics and looking at those micrometrics. All right. I think we have more time. I'm sorry, more questions than we have to allow time to allow. So let's uh. Let's see, I'm gonna take a quick look at what we have. I think this will be a good one to, to touch to. Um, do you have the ability to provide support to government entities or more specifically entities where the customer cannot share logs or files directly with CloudBees for analysis? 
Sure, um, definitely have uh, customers already in in those uh, industries and in those verticals, um, and and we'd be happy to to talk about that, but but certainly. All right. Uh, is using the backup manager recommended for backup compared to daily VMs or file system backups? Oh, that's a great question. Um, backup manager is a fantastic way to go. The there's a, there's many ways to skin that cat, but the um, the core thing, the core takeaway you should have from it is that Jenkins doesn't have a database. So the Jenkins home location is your database of record, right? So from a backup standpoint, I would want to ensure that I have a backup of the Jenkins home location, you know, how, however you decide to, to pull that off and, and people do it different ways. For ease of access, I think using backup manager is great. All right. Uh, is it recommended to deploy several masters and put load balancer in front of them or just one master to manage all the JNLP containers? Um, so I, I think the way to think about it is it's not a horizontal clustering that automatically fails solver. So when I think the Parker mentioned about that part, like we are talking about more like, I guess the sharding is probably like a better way to think about it. So yeah, it's not just, yeah. So I think that's, uh, 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 yeah, let's leave it there. Good call, good call, KK. All right, uh, let's see. Uh, for Jenkins slaves, do you have any restriction on JVMs or nodes as they're referred to now? Do I have any restrictions on nodes? Can you ask that again? Certainly, sorry. Uh, for Jenkins nodes, do you have any restrictions on JVM? Um, I, I, I'm kind of reading in between the lines on that, that question. So, um, it's important to remember that Jenkins slaves are now called agents um, and Jenkins agents are also JVMs. So you've got, well, they're, they're also job applications and, and the job application is running in, in the JVM, right? So they are going to have their own JVM settings. Um, I think that the, the load on slaves or agents are, is is somewhat intended to be minimal, um, but it really depends on the jobs that you're executing on those agents, right? So we've got most of our customers that run agent.jar right out of the box, and we've also had folks that have had to go in and increase the heap size of those agents and give them some, some additional settings to ensure that the jobs that they're running um, have enough oomph to finish. That All right. I think we have time for one more. If, if anyone did felt their question wasn't answered, please still follow up because we're going to be able to take this offline. Uh, the most important thing is to fill out that link to get the free consultation if you still have these questions because you'll get much better responses, uh, much more. We have, we have 15 minutes to really focus in on this for you. I'm going to put that link one more time in the chat in just a moment. I'll also put my email. Uh, if anyone wants to follow up after, I can make sure you get put in touch with someone. But for right now, why don't we do one more? And I think this will be a good one to end on. Uh, is the support based on the number of masters and nodes or by the Jenkins administrators count? Uh, for cloud-based Jenkins support, it is user-based. So um, it is not consumption or, or usage-based. It'd be based on um, the amount of users. All right, wonderful. Uh, that was easy enough, and we are just at the top of the hour. So I, I want to be respectful of everyone's time and, and cut this here. We do have some more questions. We'll get to everyone uh, offline after the fact. Uh, should you have any other questions, I'm putting my email in right now. You can also fill out that form, as we've said before, and make sure to talk to somebody directly. And that survey is going to pop up in just a sec so we can know what you thought and what you want to learn more about in the future. Uh, Ryan, Parker, KK, any final thoughts before we go? Yeah, I was just going to say, you know, if, you, if you're hearing from your developers that your Jenkins is slow or unusable or if there's any kind of, of negative um, connotations around using Jenkins, we want to hear about it. And we've we've got um, performance engagements that, that take place on our team. 
and we can go in and make sure that that uh, we get you we get you taken care of. Yeah, um, just a big plus one to that. Um, I think it's pretty self-evident based on the the the, the two other uh, presenters here, Ryan and KK, the um, the value that, that that we can add. And so we we would love to to contact you. And a big thank you to Ryan and, and Kosuke again. And keep us posted on whatever time is hit so that we can make the product itself better. I mean, the Jenkins itself better. And thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Talk to you next time.